Get it out of the mind. We follow the Eightfold Path, which allows us to develop under Dash Standing. It teaches us the karmic advantage of compassion, loving kind, dash, ness, appreciative joy, and equanimity. We learn the quiet satisfaction of living a more ethical and mindful life. What we are achieving is what in Buddhism is called Sutta, or true happiness. This is not the temporary pleasure that comes from a high or other temporary sense experience, but the inner peace and well-being that comes from a balanced, mindful life. It is the opposite of the suffer, dash, ing and unsatisfactoriness of dukkha. Sukha is freedom from hate, grief, and confusion. It is an expansive approach to life, being able to sit with and move through feelings of discomfort, dissatisfaction, and discontent. Many of us have been running from and denying Dukkha for a very long time, but we have found that it is only when we stop running that we are able to truly access authentic happiness. We can practice the message. I am here. This is the way it is. Right now, dot, this is a moment of suffering. May I give myself the care I need at this moment. May I accept this without struggling, but also without giving up. We've started to learn that mindfulness involves investigating our unskillful actions and choices, both past and present, and choosing to act with more wisdom in the future, rather than being bogged down by guilt or shame about the past, we can use it as a guide to making different choices in the present, as we devote energy to awakening and recovery, we'll learn to investigate our present and our past with wisdom, rather than craving or aversion. We'll experience the growth of trust in our own capacity for and right to recovery as we get a clearer understanding of what we're doing in our lives, of the choices we are making and the consequences of those choices. We gain the opportunity to develop generosity, loving kindness, forgive, dash, ness and equanimity. These are central to Buddhist practice, and to our recovery. We learn to give freely, because we understand that clinging to what is mine, is based on the delusion that we are what we possess, or what we control. We learn to have metta, our loving kindness, toward all beings in the world, whether we know them or not. We come to understand that our practice isn't just for ourselves, but is based on the interconnectedness and happiness of all living beings. Recovery transforms how we show up for those around us. We can be, dash, come the compassionate, generous, and wise friend whose calming voice and steadfast support can help others to understand their own struggles and find their own path to healing. There is no magic bullet, no single action or practice that will end suffering. This is a path composed of a set of practices that help us heal with suffering and respond wisely to our own lives. We cannot escape or avoid dukkha, but we can begin to be more at peace knowing there is a path forward, a path with less suffering, less craving, less aversion, less destruction, and less shame. It's a path without an end. It requires effort and awareness, and we don't have to do it alone. 
Recovery is the lifelong process of recovering our true nature and finding a way to an enduring and non-harmful sense of happiness. In recovery, we can finally find the peace so many of us had been search. Dash. Ing for in our addictions. We can break through our isolation and find a community of wise friends to support us on our path. We can build a home for ourselves, within ourselves, and we can help others do the same. The gift we give to ourselves, to one another, and to the world, is one of courage, understanding, compassion, and serenity. We all experience growth differently, and at our own pace. But the most important message of this book is that the journey, the healing, can start now for you and for each of us. May you find your path to recovery. May you trust in your own potential for awakening. 2. Personal Recovery Story Amy Like so many of us, I grew up never being taught what to do. With my feelings, raised by parents who were never taught what to do. With theirs, and like so many of us, Trauma scarred my young life. IXV Dash Reins those traumas alone, with no tools except the ability to compart. Dash Mentalize my feelings and fragment myself. It is no surprise that when I discovered drugs and alcohol at the age of 13, it felt like an epic. Dash Any here was the perfect way to run from myself, to numb my pain, to create what felt like a safe little world all my own where no one could touch me, and even when they did touch me, I couldn't feel it. Right from the start, I loved using alone. That was my preferred way of getting high, although of course I also did it socially. I would also get high secretly and not tell anyone, sitting there surrounded by people, feeling like a ghost. But what I loved most was sitting in my room by myself, convincing myself that this place I created inside my head was the real world, and the one outside, the one full of people and pain, was just an illusion. The first time I went to rehab, I was 16, driven by a decrease. Dash. Scion that no amount of drugs seemed to improve. I wanted it to work. And I approached sobriety like the straightest student I was. But after a year and a half, I was lonelier than ever, and I convinced myself that I could drink and use like a normal person. Not even two years later, I dropped out of my dream college, addicted to cocaine, suffering severe mental health issues, and wanting to die. By the time I finally got sober at age 28, I had spent years eking out a life despite myself. I hit a few bottoms on my way there. But somehow I ended up with a promising career, a nice partner, and a house. As always, I lived a double life, my troubled inner world hidden by my armor of privilege and accomplishment. But I was so tired. I had tried in vain for years to control my drinking and drug use doing all the things we do to lie to ourselves. I managed to quit drugs, but I would always drink again, not knowing what else to do with the feelings that would inevitably come up, the discomfort I had no idea how to sit with. 
I went to rehab again and threw myself into AA. I was lucky to have gotten sober in the Bay Area, where the 12-step community was diverse and progressive, where it was possible to find a cozy niche of women's and queer meetings that felt like home, where they didn't say the Lord's Prayer, and where their approach to the program and the big book was more trauma-informed and less dogmatic than many other places. For the first time in my life, I felt like I found my people, and I began finding myself. I learned how to be close to people. I learned how to take responsibility for my actions, and I learned that my actions affect dash and other people. Somehow, that had never occurred to me. I had been so consumed by my own pain for so much of my life, in some way I had started to believe I was the only one who felt anything. I had a good early recovery in 12 steps, and I am grateful. In my first few years, I also started exploring Buddhism, going to a day-long retreat and a few meditation groups here and there, reading everything I could find about a Buddhist approach to the 12 steps. I thought I, and my program, were invincible. At five years sober and a mother to an almost one year old, my partner and I decided we were done with city. Living and moved across the country to the mountains of North Carolina. I had always been good at moving, running from problem to problem, and starting over somewhere else. But this time, I wasn't running from something, or so I thought. My life in the Bay Area had been wonder. Dash. Full, but I was ready to start the next chapter of my life. Something was missing, and I thought I would find it in this unfamiliar place surrounded by strangers. But it didn't go quite as planned. I had expected to just fall into 12 steps here and find a new friend group like I did back in California. But the meetings were weird, full of a southern Christian god and what seemed like questionable recovery. The old timers sounded like cult lead. Dash. Furs. The repetition of readings and sayings and slogans began to wear. Thin. With the stress of a young child and a huge life transition. And with. Dash. Out the community we had back in the bay, the cracks in my marriage also started to show. I was lonely in North Carolina, and the foundation of both my recovery and my personal life was starting to feel shaky. Then I found a flyer on a coffee shop bulletin board for a bud. Yeah. P-H-I-S-T recovery group, and I decided to give it a try. The meeting was just a handful of quirky looking people sitting on cushions in a circle on the floor, talking about their lives in what felt like a refreshingly intimate and authentic way. I immediately felt like this was the room I wanted to be in. Over the next several months, I found a home in this new calm dash community. I began to see my personal growth with a Buddhist lens, addict dash Tian is something much deeper than a dependency on chemicals or even a disease. Yearning was the human condition, and we addict through whatever concoction of trauma and adverse childhood experiences and 
Hereditary influences came to feel these yearnings more intensely, often. For things beyond substances, Buddhism even in my recovery in ways. I never imagined possible in 12 steps, inviting me to not only look out, dash, more distance created by others, but ultimately look inward and trust. My own wisdom. That is not to say I think I know all the answers. I certainly knew very little about how to live an honest and healthy life when I got sober. And I needed to look outward for wisdom, to trusted groups and people who I knew had something valuable to teach me. I believe being humble is essential to wisdom, but as my recovery deepens, so does my trust of my ability to make healthy choices and to also know when I need help. Figuring out what those healthy choices are. It is easy for me to focus solely on the inward looking aspects of Buddhism and convince myself sometimes that this is a solitary path. But, there is a reason Sangha is one of the three jewels at the core of this path. And I know I cannot do this alone. It is easy for me to make Buddhism complicated, over intel, dash, intellectualized, but I also know that I feel most grounded when I focus on just being with experience rather than judging or analyzing it. When in doubt, I remind myself of the four teachings. Do no harm. God, I remind myself. That includes not doing harm to myself. Buddhist recovery has taught me the importance of being kind and gentle to myself. It has taught me to look at my intentions and mo. That motivation for doing things. It has helped me understand that I can find peace regardless of what is happening outside of myself and that I do not need external validation to feel that I am enough. And I am finding that the more I feel that I am enough, the less I crave other things to fill me up. When we started Recovery Dharma, one of our core intentions was to emphasize that this is a program of empowerment, not powerless. Dash. Ness. Acceptance of what is as part of equanimity and integral to our live. Dash. Duration, but that is not the same as powerlessness. As a writer, I know that words matter. As a survivor of trauma among so many other survivors of trauma, I know that powerlessness is not what I want my recovery to be based on. Instead, I see my recovery as a path towards wholeness and embody empowered choices. I may not always have power over what happens in the world. What happens to me, or even my own feelings, but I have power in how I choose to respond. Sometimes that power is limited by old patterns and trauma response, but it is still there. My Buddha nature, my liberation, is always inside me, always accessible. I have the power to be kind and gentle to myself and others. I have the power to set boundaries, and also to forgive. I have the power to look at my various human yearnings and discern what is motivated by craving versus what is motivated by curry. Dash. Ozzati, connection, and joy. I have the power to be present and breathe through whatever life brings me, and to be grateful for all of it. Chance, Dharma, sobriety, and my identity are delightfully blended. The pivotal push to getting sober was a feeling of disconnection from my chosen family and from myself and occasionally deep, often, mild, haunting sensations
dimension of hindered intimacy. I wanted to show up and be truly me, meeting truly them, but there was always this cloudy curtain between us. When I was 11, I started with alcohol, and my mom was one of those, as long as it's at home, substance use is okay, kind of hard. Dash. And, I was 11 and a lot of my friends were 16, so you know. We were drinking and driving, and then soon added pot, and acid, and mushrooms. I grew up in rural Ohio, and nature was a big part of my experience as a teen. We talked like we thought the substances brought us closer to nature and its beauty and mystery, but probably we would have gotten closer to the elements had we been sober and actually present. A. Dash. Fairway. I was able to escape home and two parents who didn't talk, slept in separate beds, and yet supposedly were staying together for me, bye. Sitting off and flying high with my crew. I also did a lot of drugs with my mom. She introduced me to cocaine, meth, and crack. Our share. Dependence was a distorted parent-child closeness. She was, and still is, hurt and lonely. I excelled in my tiny Catholic high school. I was a perfectionist. Took all the advanced classes, skipped a grade in French, wrote for the newspaper, pushed vegetarianism. I eventually graduated as a balletic dash Torian. I'd jam all my homework during lunchtime so that I'd be free to check out as fully as possible from after school until bedtime with drugs. And that was the cycle, day after day. My queerness emerged early on. In sixth grade, I famously death. Dash. Clark, when I grow up, I'm going to be bisexual. Which to this day, I'm fully embodying. However, in small town, sex negative USA, this was easier said than done. When I became, at that time, a girl kissing girls. The hang-ups and harassing phone calls to our house line started happen. Dad. Ing. I never denied my desires or who I am, and I paid for it, but I never considered another way to be. I had a high school girlfriend when I was in 8th grade, and we partied and learned bodies. College and grad school were more of the same. Me working so hard and then rewarding myself at the end of the day and fuzzing out. More and more special people came into my life, through queer, active, staff, speech, and academic communities. I love relationship building, exploring, navigating, co-finding channels for growth and creativity. Yet I felt that channels were blocked and separation was apparent. In fall 2012, I decided my drinking was out of control. I had never really liked alcohol. Both of my parents were alcoholics and had Dad, Dick, and I just couldn't be like them. So I cut out the alcohol, because I thought that was the problem. Things definitely felt less chaotic, and my body felt better. But the drugs continued. So much marijuana daily, plus MDMA and psychedelics often. The disconnection with my romantic Partners was palpable, so I enacted a sober sex only policy for myself. In my days, I learned quite a bit about queerness, presence, and sub. Dash. Stances then, many people 
to the usually set aside drinks and or drugs. In preparation for sex, these early negotiations around substance events, physicality were significant, they were empowering, and I was able to practice directness and consent. Yet stopping at sober sex wasn't enough. After six months of the policy, the same six months on gender-affirming hormone therapy, I went on a trip to Las Vegas with a sex worker collective I was part of. And, while I didn't know that it would be the last time, I took my last dose of drugs in the desert. The next day was my dad's birthday, not an uncomplicated date, and that became my sobriety anniversary. I stopped because I had had enough. On that desert walk in my altered state, alone but with others, I just thought about how I could get to so many of these same places with my meditation practice and so much less clinging and opacity. I was in the middle of a 90 and 90 meditation challenge I was doing with a Dharma buddy, where we would meditate 90 minutes a day for 90 days. I was committed, and I was ready for change. Upon abstaining, I had a built-in network of sober friends from my meditation community, which held a lot of sober punks. At the same time, it felt like a magnificent shift and very organic. It was simple, but not easy. I lost friends. I broke up with most of my romantic relations. Dash. Shifts. A lot of people asking, why? You don't have a problem. You never seemed like things got out of control, etc, etc. This still happens, and I'm celebrating my 10 year sober birthday. Getting sober required a lot of relief. Staying sober requires doing all the ancillary work, in addition to being active in a recovery. Community, Dharma, Sangha, Honesty, Connection, Communication, Compassion, Rupture, Repair, this one line string of words and principles encapsulates an ever-challenging life practice of being a better person and causing less harm and bringing more joy into the world. I'm extremely grateful to be embedded in a community that can reflect back these vows. Dash. Yes, while we all stumble trustfully together. I am one of the stewards of our first NYC area queer recovery. Dharma meeting, and it's truly magic. Queer and trans people healing. Together on this path, we especially need each other in this space where we can process shared experience and difficulties. Service has always been a large part of my recovery. Whether I was an interesting rep or events, chair organizing day-long retreats and my favorite, the New Year's Eve. Gathering, meeting chair, mentor wise friend, meeting location finder. And conduit, showing up, opening up, being an anchor, feeling in, dash, shored by others, and holding space is central to nourishing the group. Collective health and continuation. I like this saying that I heard from a few Dharma teachers. Don't waste your suffering. For me, this points to the power of transfer, dash, mashing in the eightfold path. It's especially supportive because it's not a consecutive sequence. To me, the Dharma is...